in London with people with mental health and substance use problems back in the late 90s and I had one of the original dual diagnosis roles as they were called back then and then from that that springboarded my career into academia and I did my PhD around training mental health staff to work with people with severe mental illness and substance use and that's kind of been a big part of my career. What's your sense of where we're at now in terms of helping people with mental illness and substance use issues? Yeah, so I think um, we've, it's gone in waves, I would say, that when I first started out, it was nothing was happening and it was a real uphill battle to get anything done in terms of coordinating care between mental health and substance use. We hadn't had a government guidance at that stage in the late 90s, that came in 2002. Um, there was a way, there was a national programme which was fantastic and there was regional hubs where we looked at implementation. This is in England of course. Um, but then that kind of, for, that ended, so the, in, the national uh, programme ended and then it's been kind of held together more by volunteers than by any sort of funding and we've managed to survive um, the last few years but it feels like now there's a bit of a resurgence of interest in the topic and I think with integrated care there's a real opportunity now to kind of really think about how integrated care can actually facilitate more joined up working for this group as well. So I think we're on the cusp of maybe some new initiatives and some new change. People with mental illness and addiction problems generally haven't been the number one priority over the last 20 or 30 years? Yeah, I think it's, it's quite surprising. It's surprising from my point of view why that has been so, because we know that the consequences of having not just substance use mental health, but usually comes with a whole array of multiple needs, why we haven't got better at addressing that. But I think, uh, and as we'll talk about more today, I think there's like issues around leadership, workforce development opportunities, and, uh, bringing the services together to work more effectively together. Those key elements are critical and they're just not working at the moment. Uh, we've got a problem with our, how we train people. We train people in silos. So if you're a mental health nurse, you look at mental health. Substance use, if you're lucky, you might have a little bit of add-on sessions, but for example, you might only have half a day in your entire three-year program. So that's a problem. Um, the same in substance use, you, uh, they don't have mental health backgrounds, so therefore uh, they struggle to recognise and help people with comorbid mental health problems in substance use. So actually we've all got the skills, but we just need to bring them together and share them. And a good example of how that can work is local networks, where you have representatives from all the services who all work together. To, um, to kind of share their knowledge and the remits of their service and generally just kind of, just, it just becomes more slick, basically. Yeah. So we wanted to understand what was going on in the UK, we wanted to find service models and then we wanted to kind of understand how they were working, in what ways, um, and all the mechanisms involved in that and resource, so including staffing and time and things like that. And what did you find? What's going on? It's very patchy, I imagine. It's extremely patchy, extremely patchy. We, we did a big mapping exercise. We found some services where they've actually commissioned posts. So that was our criteria. Um, and then we looked at those six case studies and um, we, we kind of described them. And then we, we interviewed staff, service users and carers in, in each of those areas using the realist framework that we developed from a synthesis of evidence and then we kind of it was quite a directive it's not such open-ended qualitative research it's quite directive and we wanted to unpick some of the things that make it work so i guess at the end the rico study has got some positive findings about what actually can work and what works well from both the staff point of view but also from the people who receive that service as well a lot of the research around dual diagnosis is often quite negative about what's not working and all the adverse consequences. So we feel we've got a fairly positive message to impart. Mm -hmm.